grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I know we have talked, and it's kind of nice, I mean, this is mostly our religion. And I know we have talked that Matthew, Mark, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are more like travel blogs. They like to tell you where Jesus went and what he did and with whom and when. John doesn't give you so much a travel log as as much as he wants to tell you why Jesus did this and what does it mean that Jesus does this. And so as we read this lesson today, as Jesus comes and he wants to let us know what does it mean that this resurrected Jesus is still in our midst. And he begins by, or he begins this Sunday by reading that passage, I am the good shepherd. But it's interesting, just before this one, and I know many of you know this, that I, if, if I had to pick one passage out of the entire scriptures, this would be it. Just before this one, and interestingly, it's smack dab in the middle of John's gospel. Just before this, Jesus says, I came that you might have life. And that you might have it abundantly. Not just getting from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday, but have this abundant fullness, completeness of life. And I think as you read John's, if you don't understand that one line, you're not going to understand anything else that unfolds in John's gospel. And immediately after he says this, this fullness, this abundance of life, is because there is this relationship, the good shepherd and the sheep. The image of shepherd has been used all through the Old Testament. It describes God's relationship with his people. You get Ezekiel 34, and he begins to talk about true shepherds from false shepherds. And he's talking the shepherds are the kings, and there are some good kings, and there are some. And you get Isaiah 40, and he says the true Messiah and the, the true shepherd will feed his flock like a shepherd. doesn't steal from them. And then you have that wonderful Psalm 23. The Lord is actually the shepherd, not the kings. So when Jesus comes to us today and he says, I am this good shepherd, he begins to say this divine relationship which he has with this God is now part of that relationship this Jesus has But one of the difficulties is, I don't know anything about sheep. And I don't know anything about shepherds. It is a wonderful image in the early church because everybody raised sheep. Everybody knew a shepherd. Chances were you had a shepherd in your own family. And on your way to the Holy Lutheran Church, you would have had to pass a whole mess of sheep to get here. How many of you have passed a sheep getting here today? So what does it mean when we end up saying this Jesus is the good shepherd when I don't really understand sheep? It was interesting when the missionaries came over and translated the scriptures into the native Hawaiian language. That was one of the hardest things for them to come up with because they didn't have any sheep. <laughs> the Lord is my what? And I find I'm not that far from it other than the fact I know I like lamb chops. <laughs> I went to one of my very first synod conventions, and it was while I was in Texas. And while I was there, it happened to be that it was over Good Shepherd Sunday. And one of the presenters, they brought in this lady, and she spoke to us, and she lived in West Texas, and she got up, and she had the drawl from West Texas. Her skin was all from the sun, just kind of baked and hardened. And she just got up in front of us and says, I don't know what gives me the right to say anything to all you educated people out there. But she said, they want me to talk because I've been raising sheep for over 60 years. And she says, I have heard many, many preachers give sermons on the Good Shepherd. And they are wonderful sermons. Very pastoral. Very very calming. And they're great sermons. It's just I've never known that raising sheep. Every Sunday school building I've ever been in has had that picture of Jesus standing there. And he's got the shepherd or the sheep around his shoulders. And he's holding both set of hooves. And he's gently bringing him back into the sheepfold. What you don't realize is sheep don't like to be carried. <laughs> And they really don't like to be carried that way. And they will kick and they will scramble and claw. And their, uh, their hooves are sharp and they will scratch you. And you will begin to bleed. 
And not only that, you can take the oil out of the wool. And you can sanitize it and, and, and purify it and add perfumes to it and sell it for a lot of money as lanolin. But on a sheep, it just stinks. <laughs> and in West Texas, your blood and your stink begins to go onto the sheep. And their stink begins to go onto you and their dirt and their mess. And pretty soon, you don't know where the sheep starts and where the shepherd ends. Because they begin to look the same. She says, I don't know much about preaching, but I know if you want to raise sheep, that's just the way it is. We come in here kicking and scratching and clawing and beating and bloody and stinking. And yet this Jesus keeps coming, wrestling, taking the dirt and the mess until you don't really even know where he begins and where we end because our lives are so intertwined and our futures are so connected that the good shepherd says, you are mine and I am yours. But in this one other thing, you gotta catch this one too because the good shepherd brings in, Jesus brings us the good shepherd. One thing John wants us to know, I know my father, my father knows me, I know you, you know the father. Really confusing stuff in there. But in this wonderful relationship where the good shepherd and we are bound and our futures are bound together because he won't let go. I've been dating Karen for a little while and it was, you know, you get to that point where you know this is getting serious and you know, if we're gonna move forward, we better start. So it was time for me to go out and meet her parents for the first time. <laughs> Terrifying, yes? Her parents, good, Germans, farmers from South Texas. Going to meet her new boyfriend, Yankee. Raised in the big city of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> who as a pastor will take their daughter away someday. I don't think they knew how far. <laughs> I think mean, Kawhi is pretty as far as you can get it. Not only that, we go out, she makes this beautiful dinner for us. I sit down at the table and I break the dining room chair. <laughs> there had been a light rain and there's 150 square bales out in the field and her dad says, I need to set them up so they'll dry before they get mildewed. So I said, wanting to impress the father, not that I wanted to, I'll go out and help you. And while I'm going out to help, the last thing Karen says is, the snakes like to hide under the bed. <laughs> Her daddy picked up 120 of those bales while I did 10. <laughs> Here I was, destructive, Yankee, foreigner, and a sissy to boot. <laughs> Yet when I left that meal, they took me in as part of that family. They connected me to that land, that land which had given them life. And they said, you are me, one of us. What? Had nothing to do with me, I know. But it was because for some mysterious reason, their daughter chose to love me. And if she was going to love me, and they were going to continue to love her, then they knew they had to find a way to love me as well. For some mysterious reason I will never understand, Jesus has chosen to love me. And Jesus has chosen to love you. And because this bond is there and he will not let go and our futures are intertwined, this God who loves his son Jesus finds a way to and it's in that love. We know that which is eternal. We know that which is healing. We know that which is life-giving and the abundance of life, not just existing. And we know it because it's the love we have to give to each other. Blessed good, good shepherd, Sunday.